third Acts chapter 7 we have recorded for us Stephen's sermon. And Stephen, when he addressed the people here, was not addressing the common people. He was addressing those who were religious people. He was addressing those who in their own hearts and in their own minds thought that they were serving the living God. But in reality, Stephen tells them and goes through their history that continually, time after time, and generation after generation, they not only rejected God, but they killed the prophets that were sent before them by God in order to cause them to repent. And when Stephen finished his sermon, these religious people were so angry and so mad at what he accused them of that they actually took him and drug him out of the city and stoned him to death. And why do I tell you all of this this evening, folks? Because there are a lot of religious people who are in this world. And that is as far as they will ever go. They are simply religious in the way they talk and in the way they say they act. But yet, the whole time, they remain unconverted sinners. They continue to think that because they go to church or because they were brought up in a religious background or because they said a few prayers or participated in some religious activities when they were younger, they propose to think that because they've done these things, that they are in good standing with God. Yet the Bible makes it very clear in Isaiah that says all of our good deeds, all of our righteousness, are like filthy rags in God's sight. There's not one single thing that we can do as an unconverted sinner that God will look at and be pleased with because our hearts are not right with Him. The Bible tells us that we, before we are regenerated and brought to life by the Holy Spirit, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Yet many people, Sunday after Sunday, continue to sit in church being dead, walking people. They are not living, they are simply breathing to death. So, in order to determine how it is that we can be right with God, or even if we are right standing with God, we have to use God's Word as a standard in order to compare ourselves. You see, many people look at themselves and they think of themselves as good people, but that's because they compare themselves to other people. For example, if I say I'm a good person because I don't steal, like so-and-so down the street, the guy down the street says, well, I might steal, but... I don't murder like this other guy down the street. And the guy that murders says, well, yeah, I might have murdered one person, but I'm not like Hitler who killed all these other people. And you see, the chain goes on and on and on and on. We can always find somebody who's a little bit worse than we are. But that is not how God is going to judge us when we stand before him in judgment. Hebrews 9, 27 says that it's a point for man once to die. And after this, the judgment. When we die, we will stand before God in judgment, and God will judge us by His standards. There will be no grading curve. There will be no, well, you tried, so come on in. No. God will take His holy, perfect standards and judge us by them. And what are these standards called? Well, we call them the Ten Commandments. Let's review a few of them. The very first commandment is, do not have any other gods before me. Now, oftentimes, we look at that commandment and say, well, I can't be guilty of that because I've never made an idol and bowed down to it and worship it. Well, anything that we put above God first, then that means that we have broken that first commandment. The Bible also says not to lie. If we've ever told one single lie in our entire life, then guess what? We are guilty of breaking God's standards. Praise God. The Bible also says, do not commit adultery. Now, a lot of us might say, well, hey, we committed, well, I've never committed adultery before, but you know what? Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the Mount, if we, if we even look at a person with lust, then we have committed adultery in our hearts. It's just as bad as doing the physical act, because in our hearts, we violated that standard of God by lusting and sexually fantasizing about that person. Those are just three of the commandments. If we've broken any of those commandments, God says that we are guilty of breaking His law. And if we are guilty, God will find us guilty and He will send us from separation to Him into a place called hell. Hell is not a wonderful place. As a matter of fact, it's such a 
word that brings such distaste to people that they now use it as a curse word. But the Bible describes hell as a very real, permanent place for those who unbelieve. The Bible says it is a place of weeping, it is a place of outer darkness, it is a place where people would gnash their teeth in agony. But Revelation tells us that those in hell, the smoke of their torment, will ascend forever and ever. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I do know one thing. I might not be very smart, but I can tell you one thing. We are all going to be dead a lot longer than we're going to be alive. And forever is a very, very long time. So if we have violated any of God's standards, if we have told a lie, if we've ever stolen anything regardless of its value, if we've ever committed adultery by whether the physical act or by lusting in our hearts, if we've ever used God's name as a curse word or in distaste for any reason other than in praise, we're violating God's standards and we're guilty. The bad news is, is he will find us guilty and he will cast us away from his presence. But the good news is this. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world, that means you, that means everybody out here, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, came to this earth. And he did something that nobody else was able to do. You see, he kept God's standards to perfection. Not once did he ever sin in word, thought, or deed. And at the end of his life, he voluntarily lay down his life upon the cross to pay the sin debt. But death was not the end of that because three days later, God proved that Jesus was the acceptable sacrifice for sin by raising him up from the dead. And Jesus commanded his disciples when he was raised from the dead for them to go and preach forgiveness and repentance through his name. So now, God, uh, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and because of the work that he has done, he's commanded all everywhere to repent of their sins and turn in faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, please, time is short. You are not promised another day. You're not even promised the next breath. Proverbs 9.27 says, do not boast yourself on tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring forth. In other words, folks, you don't know whether you're going to be around tomorrow. We're not promised another tomorrow. If you have heard God's standards tonight, seen yourself guilty in the light of God's law, turn from your sins and repent of them. Repentance just means simply turning away and placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. There is nothing else and no one that will save you. Acts 4.12 says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We are not going to be saved by Muhammad. We are not going to be saved by uh, Buddha. We're not going to be saved by Taoism. We're not going to be saved by Hinduism. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save us. Please, folks, we plead with you. And if you've not done that, please trust in Christ this evening. We'll be here for a little while longer. If you have any questions, we would love to come and talk to you. Thank you very much.